Dr. Martin. Thank you for joining us again. Hi, Diane. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with you. So we always hear that excision surgery is the gold standard of endometriosis treatment. Now there's a study saying that repeat surgeries for endometriosis could actually be exasperating symptoms. Can you break down this study? Because the headline itself gave me some pause. Okay. Let me, let's, let me go through some slides real quickly. I've got four of them. It's not a lot. But just to orient. We know we love our slides. Huh? I we love, love our slides. slides. We love our slides. But it, just to orient where we're going with this, because both what you said and what the, what the article says are both correct, you just have to understand the nuance behind them and right. what they're looking at. So it gets into exactly what are you saying. And to do that, we need to talk, we need to decide, are we talking about pain, infertility, mass tumor nodules and cysts, or women who have no symptoms at all? Have I got my slide up there, I hope? It's there. Yeah, okay. When we're looking at pain, there's several things we can talk about. The, the first three are hormone suppression, anti-inflammatories, and surgery. And you and I generally talk about surgery because we're talking about women with six to 10 years delay to treatment when it's mm -hmm. had plenty of time to become fibrotic and have all those other changes that almost don't respond to the first two and only respond to surgery. Uh, I'll just mention the last two because they're developmental, some antifibrotics that control scarring, nuclear factor inhibitors, and more that are in research, things that are coming online that may be better than the first two for medical treatment. And those last three, those last two have something to do with the article because what the article is hoping is that if we can diagnose pain earlier, and by earlier, we mean if dysmenorrhea, if women who are seeing doctors for dysmenorrhea have a 20% chance of having endometriosis, which we can pretty much check, guess is correct. There's some data that suggests that's correct. Then the question is, since we know that there's a one in five chance, is that worth surgery or do we wait till they have an 80% chance like we generally talk about? Mm -hmm. Somewhere in between there, we need to decide what we're going because the earlier we operate and the younger they are, the more chance there is that their body has time to recreate this disease. And, that, and that's erupt. Some, some people think some theories say that's not true and others don't. That is theory independent. All theories suggest that it can come back again. Uh, if we look at infertility, you don't go straight to surgery for infertility in the absence of pain. So this is infertility in the absence of pain. You just do a basic infertility treatment and you treat basic things like thyroid and ovulation disorders before you think about assisted reproductive technology and IVF. Mm -hmm. And then you think about that. And somewhere in between all that is inflammatory testing, because if the inflammatory testing in an infertility patient is positive, and these unfortunately right now require biopsy, which we don't want to do. But if those are positive, then surgery and two months of a GnRH agonist give you the same results. And two months of GnRH agonist is a whole lot less expensive than surgery. Mm -hmm. And for most women, much better tolerated than surgery. Uh, and the, the new ones, the GnRH antagonist, may be even better than the agonist. Mm -hmm. And the last one is we're looking at masses, tumors, nodules, cysts. For those with symptoms, you have to decide whether you're doing medical therapy, complementary alternative medicine, surgery, what you're going to do. But if there are no symptoms, you have to decide on what is the long-term surveillance. So we're going to get into all of those questions in the process of doing this today. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me just go back to your question. What did they say? So the biologic is what we're gonna talk about first. And that is endometriosis surgery has the characteristics of all surgery. That includes whether you're having a mole taken off or an appendectomy or anything. It has other characteristics that are more like keloid and adhesion surgery because you don't wanna operate on keloids or adhesions unless you have to, because you can sure make them worse. Mm -hmm. And then some that are specific for endometriosis. So everyone knows that any surgery, not just endometriosis surgery, any surgery can be complicated by excess scarring, adhesions or pain. I had knee surgery 51 years ago and it still hurts when I exercise too much, if it gets too cold or if I don't sleep at least six hours a night. Wow. Eight hours sleep is even better. And I imagine that's also true for endometriosis pain, if you're not sleeping well, mm -hmm. the pain's gonna get worse. Uh, but endometriosis surgery, like keloid and adhesion surgery, 
has the potential for mo more problems because of what has been called immunological dysfunction or internal overhealing. So when adhesions, keloid, or endometriosis are removed, overhealing can occur and increase the problems. And the last is that endometriosis is potentially more complex because there's some chance that endometriosis may activate the neuroimmune systems, uh, cause more immunologic dysfunction, and actually make the endometriosis grow. So bottom line on all that, endometriosis sufferers have the problems of all three components, the, stand, the general ones for surgery, the ones for fibrotic diseases, and things that are specific for endometriosis. Dr. Martin, not to skip ahead a bit, but the antifibrotic medication, Sure. what exactly is that? What would that look like? So right now there's research on that. Uh, propranolol is an example. Uh, it, it's just, propranolol is just a standard cardiac medicine. It's low, it's low risk for what we're using it for. Mm -hmm. It would just be a pill. It's not, not very exciting medicine. The research on it suggests that it may have a, may have a, uh, may have a, uh, it may be useful, but we hope that we, but the research, like all the research on every medicine we ever use, there's conflicting information and we come to yeah. different answers from different people, but it looks like anything that decreases inflammation and, and this one in specific may, may decrease fibrosis in certain situations may be useful. We just, it's like the standard answer to everything about research right now is it needs more research, it needs definition. We need to know, are there better medicines than propanolol that might be useful? Would that kind of medication be used post excision surgery to prevent scarring from the actual surgery or would it be to prevent endo adhesions? How, how would that be used if you know? Is this a softball question? Or do you, already, or do you know that I wrote a paper on that last year? <laughs> The paper, the paper suggested that we should consider using post-op treatment with either propranolol in specific was one we were talking about, or using birth control pills or something to decrease uh, hormonal stimulation and some sort of anti-inflammatory medication because the immune dysfunction that happens in endometriosis is related to all those components. Mm -hmm. If we can if we can, so remember estrogen is an inflammatory stimulator. So estrogens increase the inf inflammation. Surgery itself can increase the inflammation. And it may be that decreasing the estrogens and decreasing the inflammatory component decreases the chance that the immune dysfunction will continue. Okay. So what you're saying is it's interesting because usually after excision surgery, there's not really given antifibrotics that I know of. So this might be a new way. Well, that depends on who you talk to. Mm -hmm. Most of us in the world, we've all, always put patients on anti-inflammatories and hormone suppressions after surgery because we routinely thought it was better. And you'll find other people who think that that should never be used. So that's a real, that's a real, it's a real controversial subject because you okay. have people like me who are committed to using some sort of post-operative therapy and other people who are fully committed to avoiding it because they don't believe a thing I say. <sighs> or maybe they believe some of it, but not all of it. I don't, I don't know. You have to, we'd have, that, that'd be one of those things you almost want to start a debate with. Get, get one of them out and get me out and see, see who, who does I'm more. sure all treatment, you know, treatments are, are, options are always very controversial in the medical community, but it seems especially with endometriosis because there's so, no, I mean, there's a lot of research out there, but I feel like we're still at the brink of it. And it's, uh, you know, people come from many different schools of thought. There was, there was a, somebody, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday or two days ago on this subject. And we talked about why we have so many different versions of what we do to endometriosis. And I think the, the simple answer he and I came up with, it is no longer like what I thought in the 1960s, and that is endometriosis is a dark scarred lesion. Hmm. Or what I thought by 1989 or so, when I thought there were 20 different types, or it may be the 360,000 types that are suggested in the GEO database. So we don't know if we're talking about three different diseases, 20 different diseases, 300,000 different diseases. And we have data that can support any one of those numbers. Until we, until we know what we mean when we say endometriosis, it's going to be difficult to come 
to any sort of firm decisions. Uh, sometime we'll have a, a conversation, you and I, about definitions, because there's so many definitions of what yes. endometriosis is that it'll make your head spin. Mm -hmm. How, um, when you read this article, the study about repeated endometriosis surgeries, yes. what do you think the main takeaway for the person with endo, what okay. should they take away from it? So the main takeaway is that this article is about early peritoneal endometriosis in patients who have a few months or years or, or maybe a year or so, something, something less than chronic. So this is about women who are having early symptoms. This is what you should be doing in the first six to 12 months. And I don't think it really changes anything. Even those people who think everybody should have surgery will tell you that you don't want to treat everybody who has dysmenorrhea. Right. But we have people on the web who will tell you everybody should be thinking about surgery, but they'll also tell you that if you're a teenager who has early dysmenorrhea, the fact that you have a 20% chance of endometriosis isn't enough to justify surgery unless, and there's some, there's all always disclaimers, unless mm -hmm. you find a nodule on exam, a nodule on, on sonographic imaging, a cyst, or some other reason to have surgery, that you should at least start out with birth control pills and non steroidals and give those a three to six month trial. But somewhere after six months, and whether it's six months or a year, you got to be making decisions. We don't want to wait seven years to no. make a decision. So this article is talking about the early treatment, and they're talking about peritoneal endometriosis. They're not talking about deep infiltrating endometriosis or any infiltrating endometriosis, which is what you and I generally talk about. Right. What they suggest is that if you have early disease, medical or complementary and alternative treatments, and some of this may include dietary and others, that encourage control by the neuroimmune system may increase the chance that your body can cure the endometriosis so that we're not using the medicine to cure the endometriosis. We're using the body to help the neuroimmune system respond mm -hmm. because if the neuroimmune system can respond, it may not be a future problem. We know that if you look at women who are having tubal ligation, so these are women who are fertile, they've had babies, they're relatively asymptomatic and all they're going in for a tubal ligation is that 5.7% of those are going to have endometriosis. If you look at all the all 16 studies, if you only look at those studies where they were had a symptomatic or surgical protocol, it jumps to the 17%. That contrast, so that 17% contrast of the 10% we normally talk about, 4% of those are pain, 6% are infertility. So if we're right, that 17% in tubal ligation series is four times greater than the number who have pain. So the neuroimmune system may be capable of converting those into a relatively free form if we can treat it early enough and take it seriously. Right. We can't have delay and we can't have normalization of pain. That's why early intervention is key. Yes. Well, thank you for clarifying the article because it was a little bit alarming when I first read it. I sent it right over to you and I'm glad that we were able to deconstruct it and uh, give it some give it some more clarity. Let me let me give you two slides on that that article because there were two yes. slides that I think are worth talking about because this this article has more data than I think anybody should ever have to deal with. But I've, I've, I've combed it down to two slides. So let me get my two slides. So this is Table Five in the fifth postoperative year. We're going to look at those blue, green, and red sections below in specific. When we look at those, then if you save the uterus or save the ovaries, the claims for pain and emergency room visits are in 47 and 41 percent, and the repeat surgeries are still 21 percent. If you look at women who've had hysterectomies or oophorectomies, those numbers decrease significantly, and that last sequence shows how much the decrease is. Hmm. So the number of claims for pain has decreased by 84%, those for more emergency visits by 90%, and those for more repeat surgery by 94%. Remembering that this is in a general or primary population. This is not a referral population. Mm -hmm. Primary populations generally have better health, better outcomes than tertiary care or referral populations. Uh, Basics, the basic for that is primary populations are generally being treated in the first months or years of their treatment and tertiaries at six to 10 years. 
people who've had six or 10 years of pain don't do as well on treatment as ones who had one to two years. And I don't think that should be surprising. No. But if we look carefully at that 84, 94% down below, that discrepancy between claims for pain and claims for surgery looks good on first view, but there's a, there's a, a possibility that that significant decrease in repeat surgeries is more related to the normalization of pain or, or is partially related to the normalization of pain as much as it is to biopsy. Mm-hmm. And that's a concern. It needs more research. Yeah, no, thank you. That was very, very helpful. Um, Again, I am so happy you joined us because I don't want anyone to read that article and have the same reaction I did of, oh my gosh, did I treat myself in the wrong way um, when excision is the gold standard right now? But like, you, you 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 may have been treated in the wrong way, but it was probably, what was, what was the first year you remember having cramps that were interfering with activities? Oh, I was, uh, the onset of my my period, which I was only 11 years old. I got very, so very if sick. You, if you treated it wrong, you treated it wrong when you were 11 years old. Yeah. And that yeah. wouldn't, and, and that wouldn't surprise you at all, would it? And whether oh, no. you're treating it wrong or the people around you treating no, it No, I kept having ovarian cysts bursting and I kept being told this was normal. Yeah. And, so. and, and when we look at that, remember, that's the common response by society as a whole Yes. That's not only you and your relatives and your friends and your peers, but remember, out of that group come the doctors. Yeah. And the fact that the doctors are part of that group is the most distressing to me because I think that they could they could learn that normalization is not normal better than everybody else. But there's still a lot of physicians who normalize pain. Well, I'm hoping that with doing programs like this and doing the work that we're doing over at the Endo Found and all of our other advocates all over the world that that will change among physicians and that they'll be more empathetic and knowledgeable so that when an 11 year old female person with the uterus comes in and says, I have these symptoms, it's not here, take birth control. And yes, you're in debilitating pain, but that's part of the the experience. Um, So I'm hoping that we'll make great strides in the next generations. Yes. And, and thank you for all your work, Dr. Martin. You're, uh, you definitely have, have left your mark in a very positive way in this community. Well, let's, let's, let's hope that something good comes of it in the next few years. If not the next, it'd be nice if it were going to be the next few days or weeks, but I'm going to got years worth of research to do. True, true. Thank you, Dr. Martin. We'll see you soon. Thank you now, Diana.